Hello, everyone who's joined the call. Uh, we currently have 218 people here, over 500 registered. So let's just wait for another two minutes before we start. Thanks for being patient. All right, looks like the number of participants is plateaued at around 228 and uh, it's already 12 minutes past the start time. So we'll be starting in less than 60 seconds. Uh, so if you already have not already opened up the form, uh, please visit the link here and click on the answer form link. There are also instructions here, which you should probably go through once because I see a lot of you raising hands and posting questions in the Q&A, a lot of which are already covered here.
All right, it's it's time we start. So welcome to the first QF one of this season. Wait. Oh yeah, the recording is begun. Yeah, welcome to the first QF one of this season. Uh, so we have twenty questions, all of which are to be attempted individually, without the aid of. Uh, online search engines and other members of your family. So the QM, that is me today, will run the quiz as four rounds of five questions each. So in your answer form and in the slides, you will find it split into quarters. So there are four quarters, each with five questions. So the participants will watch the Zoom call or the YouTube stream and attempt the quiz by entering the guesses through Google Forms. So if you had followed this link, you would have found uh, a Google form where you enter your answers. So you can either enter it on those Google forms or you can in, pick up some piece of paper around you and write it there or open up a notepad file and write it there. But you're high, uh, strongly encouraged to use the Google form uh, space provided because uh, you don't have to keep um, moving up between different applications and so on. So you, you are requested to provide a valid email address in the Google form. This email ID will never be made public. It will only be used by Google forms to send you the scores, stats and updates. So at the end of the quiz, once you, sub, uh, once you press submit, you will get a uh, an automated uh, message from Google Forms with a score, so you, you you will need it for that. This will never be made public, uh, and QFI will never send you unsolicited mail and uh, any spam. Right? There is no negative marking. Minor spelling mistakes can be forgiven. Surname should generally suffice and until unless specified. So people participating in the Zoom call. Uh, can also ask the QM for clarifications live through Zoom chat. Some of you have already been doing that. And the QM will give some suitable clues to relevant questions. Uh, participants can, all, can also attempt to answer the questions on the pass uh, when the answers are discussed by clicking the raise hand button. There's some four of you already raised hands now. So that, uh, the QM will enable your audio and, re and, and then you can uh, speak up and then we, every, everyone will hear it. You do, you do not get additional points for uh, 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 shouting out the answer. This is simply for fun, just like the rest of the quiz. And so speaking of raised hands, let's see what the people who have raised hands want to say. So if uh, if you have an, if you've raised your hand for anything, maybe you can type it out on chat and then uh, so one of us will respond. Balaji Subbaraman, Vishalini Lakshana, Tathagata Chatterji. A lot of you have raised hands, so maybe you can just type it on chat. Okay, so somebody said my screen is not very clear. It, it, it seems clear enough to me on, when, when I previewed in the uh, uh, YouTube uh, stream. Okay, fine. A lot of random spamming going on, but okay, right. So uh, for each question uh, at the end, you will need to mark yourself whether you got the answer right or wrong. So we trust you to be fair here. Don't give yourself uh, points for part answers or incomplete ones. The overall statistics calculated based on all participants submissions will be completely anonymized. Nobody except you can ever know what score you got. 
So be honest and don't worry. We're all doing this only for fun and learning. So how this is going to work is that the entire you know, QF1 uh, league in the past was done when a few, few people would gather in a room and uh, the questions would be run by a proctor and people would write the answers individually and then uh, they would exchange sheets and correct and, and then submit scores to us. Uh, this, this was okay. Uh, and uh, we had over a thousand people participating a few on several occasions and so on. And we maintained a leaderboard. Now, the one thing we can't do it during lockdown is that you, you cannot uh, trust that everyone is going to be honest here because a lot of people do Google. And, and it's very evident uh, when you are, when you get when you keep attending quizzes during the lockdown. So, so what we can do instead is remove all incentives for cheating. So if you get twenty out of twenty, brilliant. There's nobody else in the whole world who will ever care or know. And if you get zero, still no, nobody is going to judge you. So you're going to do the entire thing entirely for yourself, right? So. You, you, it's, it's up to you whether you want to be honest or not, but uh, the, the only one who's going to benefit is you. So you can see how well you're placed against peers from around the world if you're honest. So after the quiz is over, don't forget to press the submit button and record your score. So once you press the submit button, you get links to a um, sheet where you can see your current standing and cumulative performance and statistics like average and question wise the performance, the percentile, all of that will be updated automatically and you can look at that. So, so don't forget to press the submit button. And then if you have any feedback, send it to mail at quizfoundation.com, right? I have waffled on for quite a bit. So before we start, let me just look at uh, or the Q and A and the other chat and all of that. Okay, it's nothing. All right, so. There will not be a rerun of the questions. So if, if you missed anything already, you may probably want to switch to the YouTube stream and then catch up from there. Uh, but throughout the entire uh, uh, um, series of quiz quizzes we are going to do in QF1, we have one shot and we are, you are strongly encouraged to, and uh, not, not encouraged, in fact, you are required to look at each question only once. Please go on. I think we can start. Go on. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, um, Vinit, I I think you can uh, uh, manage all the chat and uh, Q. Yeah. 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 We'll do that. We just uh, stay okay. on the questions. Okay. Fine. It's fine. So let, let let's start. So, uh, if, for this specific quiz, all blank lines are indicative, unless specified otherwise. Please write first names also, if you can. Um, but uh, if you if you can't also, it's fine. So there are no audio video questions. The keywords are necessary and sufficient for points in all questions. And, and lastly, stay self-isolated and healthy. All right. So um, with all with enough uh, done and I waffled on for quite a bit and we have around 239 participants here uh, in the Zoom call and, and quite a few watching the uh, stream on YouTube as well. So welcome to all of you and we'll start get started with the first question. So this design that became standard in the mid 19th century was created by Nathan Cook and not the person it's named after. Cook was inspired by neoclassical architecture in Victorian London and specifically by tripartite columns and Italianate balustrades. The most distinctive element of Cook's design was inspired by this Elgin marble sculpture from Celine's chariot in the Parthenon. 
So which group's current design is by Nathan Cook? Right, so I have some bigger images and an explanation of what a balustrade is. So this here is what a balustrade is. You might have seen it in uh, balconies and so on. So this is a balustrade and this is something from uh, Celine's chariot in the Parthenon. A certain design that we are all familiar with was inspired by uh, this specific uh, sculpture and the design of those balustrades. Harish, one question is uh, uh, what you mean when you say group? Is it a rock or pop group is the question. So, if you want to elaborate a little bit on that. By, by group, I mean some, um, some, some grouping or some set. So if your answer has a five-letter word, that is sufficient. It's something we're all familiar with. The design is inspired from this specific sculpture and the look of the balusters, balustrades, they're the same thing. This is question one. Okay, we're moving to question two. Grad student Hayden Thomas knew that organic matter decomposes faster in warmer soil. He theorized that this fact could be used to understand how much global warming is happening in the Arctic tundra by analyzing how much weight some natural substance loses when immersed into soil and removed later. He wanted cheap and widely available pouches of organic substances that have fixed weights and composition that volunteers anywhere in the world could easily procure, bury for a few weeks, and then reweigh. During an afternoon break in a conference, he found a solution. So what organic substance did he suggest using? This is now among the more uh, well-known global warming metrics. So some guy during an afternoon break in a conference th thought about how to measure how much decomposition is happening. And so he said, we can take something, immerse it into soil and remove it later. And the advantage of this was that it was cheap, uh, widely available throughout the world. And it, it was already there in organic uh, uh, pouches. So what organic substance do you suggest using? Uh, the answer is a, uh, simple uh, if your answer has a simple three letter english word you're correct i don't hear vinod interrupting me so i presume there are no questions here i'll give you another 10 seconds of this question Uh, there's one question asking for more clues of any. So, is there anything that you want to add? Okay. So, uh, just look at the words that I've uh, highlighted here. So, you immerse into soil and then remove it later. So, think of something else which you immerse and then remove, which is organic substance that is available in a pouch and available throughout the world with fixed weights. and something that he discovered during an afternoon break in a conference. Yep, 
thing that should suffice is going to question three. The New York Historical Society is the only place that has a certain 19th century vestige, something that you could once see in municipal documents, the New York Times, books, and maps. Despite treasure to drop it for the sake of consistency with the rest of the city, the New York Historical Society Museum and Library proud, proudly displayed even today. So what specific vestige is this? So vestige is something that was once there and once served a purpose, but now is irrelevant. So the New York Historical Society once had such a, uh, once had something that was relevant, but now is not. So what is it that they still cling on to? So the image is very helpful. Look at the image carefully, uh, look at the text carefully, and you can easily figure out the answer. Harish, you may want to explain what a vestige is, uh, if you can, there's something that you can add on top of that. No, I, I just explained it. So vestige is something that uh, it, it was relevant in the 19th century. That is, in the 19th century, the New York Times, municipal documents, books, maps, all of them had this. But then over the turn of the century and, last, and uh, at least for the last 70 years or so, all of them have dropped it, saying it's not needed anymore. And then there was a um, move around the city where you want to make everything consistent. Everything else uh, removed it except the New York Historical Society. So what is that? The questions around whether the image is uh, helpful. Oh yeah, the image is helpful. You don't need to know who the guy is and all. That is not helpful, but the rest of the image is helpful. Okay, I'm going to question four. This professor at the St. Petersburg Imperial University, St. Petersburg, obviously in Russia. So this professor at the St. Petersburg Imperial University had taken a long time to write the first volume of a textbook, a 500 page dreary tome covering only the first eight of more than a hundred. This annoyed the publisher who insisted that uh, the professor furnished the draft of a crisp volume two in just a few weeks. In such uh, pressurizing circumstances, the professor got an inspired and concise way of presenting information. So what does appear for the first time in his 1869 second volume textbook? So once again, the 19, uh, second half of the 19th cent uh, century is one professor in St. Petersburg. He's written one part of the textbook and that's 500 pages and it's long winded, boring, lot of repetition and you cover only the first eight of more than a hundred. And the publisher gets angry and says, I want you to finish up quickly. And so he thinks about how he can present the, all the information he wants to say. And he gets an idea such that he can present everything in a uh, nice and concise way. So what is it? What, what does uh, appear in this uh, for the first time in his 1869 second volume textbook? So Harish, uh, one question is uh, around uh, whether this professor's surname is enough or whether it's needed. So, I, uh, Okay, I don't need the name of the professor at all. Just tell me what, what did he come up with to present information in a uh, concise way. One more question is uh, a confirmation on whether it's 100 plus or close to 100, whether it's actually more than 100. 
Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 now it's more than 100 for sure. Yeah, I'm not too sure what the number was then, but even even then, it was uh, around this. All right, I think that's sufficient time for this question, and we go on to the last question of this quarter. In the 1960s. John Stone was looking for inspiration for a show he was commissioned to make when he saw this public service campaign to give a damn about black kids living in New York's ghettos. Seeing this made Stone realize that for his show to be relatable, it had to be set among the Harlem brownstones with fire hydrants, corner shops, and galvanized trash cans. So the setting of what show was inspired by this ad? Uh, so there's some text there which is not very helpful, which is why I've kind of made, put the translucent uh, box over it. You, what what you should uh, uh, look at is that a lot of kids in New York's ghettos are going to need to, something to do in summer, and you can provide play streets and uh, bus trips and little recreation. And he saw this and then he thought of uh, Harlem brownstones and fire hydrants and corner shops and galvanized trash cans. So think of what show that first premiered in the late 1960s has uh, Harlem brownstones, fire hydrants and all of that so that black kids will be able to relate to it. If you want a hint, the show is still going on. Harish, can you go back to the image again? Yeah, I think you can just show the text once quickly and then go on. All right. Yep. Uh, I hope you have put in guesses for all five questions in the first quarter. And so Let's look at the answers right now. So how this is going to work is that once a question comes up and you know the answer, you put up your hand. So if uh, if you already raised your hand, maybe you can uh, lower, uh, lower your hand. Uh, Vinod, maybe you want to lower everyone's hands. And then once a question comes up, uh, we, you can raise your hand and then you'll be promoted up and you can answer a lot on the mic. So, so we go to the first question. So uh, what is this that was uh, inspired by the Elgin marble? Are there any raised hands? I see four, 15 raised hands. The JK, one. You, JK, Abhishek, please go ahead. Yeah, so the answer is chess pieces. That is correct. So this is the chess set or the Staunton chess set. Uh, the pawn was based on the baluster. So Staunton was a chess player and... Uh, it was named after him. He was like the brand ambassador. Uh, but the word chess is needed for points. So uh, you, you'll get some sort of an, uh, answer rubric on, on, for each question. So just follow that. So if you if you mentioned the word chess, you get full points and you can treat your answer as correct. If you've written stunt on somewhere, then, then also you get right. 
if you have written night somewhere, then also you get points. But all other answers are incorrect. Right. So I, I I don't hear any protest. So moving on to question two. So Harish, there's a question on whether we need to submit every round. So can you just clarify the format once more on? Okay. Fine. Right. So you submit only once at the end of the quiz. You you do not sub you do not press the submit button. So what you do right now is you, uh, you 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 just mention whether you got it right or wrong. So you have two radio buttons that says, "Did you get question one right?" and yes or no. So if you got it right, click on yes. If you got it wrong, click on no. That's it. Uh, this question: a way to measure uh, global warming using something that you immerse and then. Harish, can you move on to the next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does anyone has anyone raised their hands for this? People have raised hands. I'll enable Siddharth. Uh, so this is the tea bag. Tea bag. That's right. The, the tea bags is right. Uh, this is the tea bag index. So you take tea bags, immerse it, and then see how much weight it has lost. So if it loses more weight, that means uh, that place is warmer, and hence uh, you can use that for global warming over a period of time. So if you've written the word tea anywhere in your answer, you get points. Right. I, I don't think there's any other alternate that can fit you points. So if the word T is there, then you get points. So we want to question three. The New York Historical Society has something that uh, others had, but now don't. What is it? Asha, please go ahead. The hyphen between the words New and York. That is right. So this is uh, the hyphen in New York. So if you notice it here, you have the New York Times with a hyphen. So in the question two, you could uh, see uh, the New uh, New York with the hyphen there. And that is why I put uh, quotes and all of that there. So if you've written the word hyphen anywhere in your answer, when clearly say state that it's between New York and York, you get full points. If you've written an iPhone in your answer, but that's not between you and York, but somehow it's just there in your answer, then you don't get points. But if there is an hyphen that is between you and York in your answer, then you get full points. So Rich, one question is dash accepted. Yeah, dash is fine. Dash hyphen, dash is also accepted. Okay, so we got a question four. So what appeared for the first time in volume two of uh, this Russian professor's textbook? A crisp way of presenting information. Any raised hands? Yeah, Pala, uh, please go ahead. It's the periodic table, Mendeleev. That is right. This is the periodic table. So this is how he came up with it. Uh, the professor is obviously Mendeleev. So the word periodic table is needed for points. If you written mentally, but now the periodic table, then say of source and then grown and all of that, but mark yourself wrong. You need to have written periodic table for points. Right. So we go to question five. A show that is still going on from the late 1960s that is set among Harlem brownstones and has uh, trash cans and corner shops and fire hydrants. And provides children with bus trips and play streets. So, what show is this? Shrinivas Ramanujan, please go ahead. Shrinivas Ramanujan, we are waiting for you. Is it Brooklyn Nine Nine? It's not Brooklyn Nine Nine. Ravi Kiran, please go ahead. Is it Sesame Street? That is right. 
So this is Sesame Street, and this is how the idea of setting it in a street itself came. Uh, so he he initially had the idea of using Muppets and so on, but uh, the and the reason why it's set in a street, and you can see corner shops and the trash can, which is where this guy is, and then all the settings and all is inspired from this. And the correct answer is only Sesame Street. So if you've written Sesame Street, then give yourself. Uh, uh, one point or mark yourself correct if you've written i don't know like some indian version of sesame street i don't know I don't what it's called some gully gully simsim or something then also you get points but uh, but nothing else all right so uh, this is the end of the first quarter let's move to the second quarter some questions right now so the 2017 Republic Day float of Haryana was about the Save the Girl Child effort and featured uh, the three Haryan we featured three Haryan V women who had gone on to achieve international fame. If two of those are uh, Olympic and Paralympic medalists uh, from 2016, Sakshi Malik and Deepa Malik, who's the third woman who's a poster child of the Save the Girl Child campaign in Haryana? Someone who achieved success in a totally different space. I'm not going to say who is who here. There are three women, all from Haryana. Two of them are Sakshi Malik and Deepa Malik. Okay, I have some other pictures here. Who's the third woman there? Surname will suffice. But I doubt if people will know only the surname, but not the first name. Yeah, if you know the answer, don't raise your hand now. We, you can uh, tell it out when we're going through the answers well, in a few, five, in five minutes or so. All right, so this is, seems to be a simple enough question. So we'll go on to question seven. And there's a huge surge in the number of girls in the US wanting to learn the saxophone in the early 90s. This trend is, is entirely due to one person American TV audiences would have seen and still continue to see playing the saxophone for about five seconds every week for around half the year. So who specifically was responsible for this craze? So the first name is also needed or the context in which uh, American TV audiences would have seen this specific character play the saxophone for five seconds every week for half the year, it would also work. So think of a girl who plays a saxophone and appears in a TV show. That was popular since the early 90s and is popular even now. Uh, there's a question whether the name of the character is needed or just a TV show. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the name of the character would uh, would uh, help. Or which part of the TV show would you have seen the character? Uh, would you have seen the saxophone play? All right, so I'll, I'll go on to question eight. So between the 16th and 18th centuries, these were used as memento mori and uh, vanitas in European painting. So memento mori and vanitas are grim reminders of the inevitable sudden disappearance of life. And they were symbols of the fleeting nature of the innocence of childhood. However, 
in the 21st century they have taken up an entirely different meaning of fun playfulness and harmlessness so for these reasons and because using them is a simple litter free and inexpensive way to create hundreds of rainbows they are common in pride parades around the world so what are these objects so between the 16th and 18th century there were uh, symbols of death and fleeting nature and childhood innocence will disappear eventually and so on but now they are a litter free inexpensive simple way to create rainbows and pride parades and are seen as fun playful and harmless things so what are these things a simple english word six or seven letters seven if you are using the plural six if you are using the singular all right i uh, this seems to be no question so moving to question 9 so though the titular character of this early 20th century kid friendly play was male for many years the role was typically played by a woman so maud adams the first to perform in this role whom you see in the image on the right in character in fact so gave the character's costume a distinctive collar this kind of collar is now named after the character maud adams played so after which fictional character is this collar named for i'll give you a hint it's alliterative so i need both a first name and a last name kind of a fictional character who's male but typically performed by women the first to perform in this role gave the character a distinctive collar this kind of collar is now popular among uh, uh, women and it's named after the character maud adams played so what character did she play or what is the name of the collar the hint i gave was alliterative Arjun, you may want to just explain alliterative what it means. There's some questions. Okay, fine. So let me clarify what alliterative means. So uh, you can think that it starts with a uh, similar sounding uh, syllable. So at least the consonant part of the syllable is the same for two consecutive words, like. Uh, hmm. dirty dancing that's alliterative because it has the same der sound that that uh, is found at the beginning of both words like that all right so question 10 which is the last of this quarter known for its quirky advertising the vancouver aquarium had a campaign to promote it's a refurbished seahorse exhibit for this they put up rigged versions of certain devices in urinals in men's restrooms of local establishments along with a fact about seahorses so what devices did they put in, um, in uh, urinals of men's restrooms typically used only in women's restrooms were they used in this stunt so what they did was they took a certain uh, device that is typically used only in uh, women's restrooms and put it up in men's restrooms and surprised everyone and this was a rigged version of the device but they were just promoting their uh, seahorse uh, exhibit and there is an interesting fact about seahorses that so rake your brains think of what in what is one interesting fact about a seahorse something that makes it very unique 
and some and then also think of a device that is typically used only in women's restrooms or device or some sort of equipment that is typically used only in women's restrooms but was now present in urine uh, men's restroom urinals so harish the question is is the fact about the sea horse is alone enough or do we need more if you know the the fact this fact in question you should be able to figure out what device it is and that is what i want Yep. All right. So let's go. Let's move on to the answers. I hope uh, uh, JK is here to pr promote people and all of that. So question six. Lot of raised hands. See that. Please go ahead. Yes. This is. Yeah. Go on. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. You are. Go on. Yes. Ha. Yes. So this is uh, Kalpana Chola. That is right. Kalpana Chola is right. Uh, so as you remember, the other two were uh, you know, 2016 Olympic medalists and Paralympic medalists. But Kalpana Chola is the third person. So if you're written Chola, you get full points. Going to question seven. This is steady increase in. Raised hands. Ravi Kiran, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, this would be Lisa Simpson uh, with the saxophone intro in the Simpsons that, intro. That is. That is correct. So this is Lisa Simpson in the Simpsons opening sequence. So if you've written Lisa Simpson, you get full points. If you've written Simpsons opening sequence, you get full points. If you've written just Simpsons. I am not too sure because I have clarified. I clarified multiple times that we need something more. So, uh, since we are not giving half points here, you can. No, you know it's fine. If you've written just Simpsons, also you get points. Just take it. So Lisa Simpson, Simpsons opening sequence, or just Simpsons. So question eight. Ravi Anand, please go ahead. Yeah, so bubbles, soap bubbles, and that's all. That is correct. So this is bubbles. So uh, if you look at the images on the right, you see a lot of bubbles in bright parades. Yeah, this is the Milai painting, and this inspired the Milai painting. Okay, so the word bubble is needed for one point. Balloon is incorrect. Uh, anything, anything else is incorrect. You need either bubble or bu bubbles for points. So question nine. Varun, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, is this Peter Pan? Peter Pan is correct. This is the Peter Pan collar. So points only for Peter Pan. No points for just Pan or anything else. So Peter Pan is correct. And question ten. Akila, please go ahead. Um. Yeah. Is it the pregnancy test? Very, very good. This is correct. That is correct. This is the pregnancy test, and the fact is that it's the male seahorse that gets pregnant and not the female seahorse. And so to raise awareness of that, they put up a heat sensitive uh, pregnant pregnancy test device in men's urinals, and then it would uh, just for fun just show up pregnant, and all the men would freak out, and then they would see up and see the sign that says that in the aquatic world, uh, mommies are the only ones who get pregnant because that male sea horses also get pregnant. So the full points if the answer uh, contains any of the following words: pregnancy, pregnant. Uh, Dipstick, 
HCG, I don't know. Anything of this sort. So, Harish, there is one question which I'm sure you're going to object to, but the question is, is bassinet accepted? Uh, can I repeat? Bassinet in urinals, is it accepted? I'm sure it's no, I just wanted to run it through. And no, it's not accepted. Yeah, you, you, it needs to be something along the pregnancy lines. So if you've got it, uh, very well done. This was a pretty tough question. All right. We're doing good on time. So let's, let's quickly go to the third quarter. Apart from these three traditional blades, the foil, EP, and the saber, the French Fencing Federation officially recognized another weapon last year in a name to get more people interested in fencing. So wielders of the weapon are encouraged to make big sweeping blows, thereby setting off an iconic sound in the sword mechanism. So what is this universally known weapon? Okay, so the fencing was not very popular uh, till maybe now it's popular during uh, COVID times, but before that uh, it wasn't. And they wanted to make it more popular, and so they so they suggested using another kind of sword, so that they get kids interested and nerds interested. And what is this sword? That makes a big sweeping. Uh, that makes an iconic sound when you make a big sweeping blow. Just a second. All right. I'm going to question twelve. So those who have read about Raphael, the artist will know that he had a love interest called the Baker's Daughter or La Fornarina. So this question is about her. They, uh, historians are kind of certain that her name was Margarita. Apart from parish, rec parish records, that is church records, a big hint was that Raphael included a Mar Margarita in all his latter portraits of women. So what does the word Margarita mean in Latin and Italian? So if it helps, Margarita shares etymological roots with, Sans with the Sanskrit word manjari. So yeah, I'm just clarifying Margarita is not a pizza or a drink and all. What does the word Margarita mean? The hint is that if you observe all these portraits, I'm going to show you a bunch of images. All the women here have a Margarita somewhere around them. So just look at all these images, find what is common. So observe the images carefully and find what is common to all these images. This was Raphael's uh, subtle way of saying that the woman he liked was named Margarita. Okay, so there are no questions. So we just move to question 13. A 2019 research from Stanford showed that since mid-2017, the county of Merseyside in Northwest England has become significantly less Islamophobic compared to the rest of England. So they observed that there are two phenomena. The number of hate crimes against Muslims has dropped by 19%. 
in Merseyside compared to the rest of England. The number of negative tweets about Muslim foreigners fell by half among people from Merseyside who had at some time used a certain four letter or four word hashtag on Twitter. So the research attributes this trend singularly to the increasing fondness towards one religious Muslim among the people of Merseyside. So who is this much beloved Muslim? Muslim foreigner, if it helps. So Harish, there's a question which I don't understand, but maybe you will. It says, will the hashtag do? No, I no, no. The hashtag will not. I want. I want the name of the person. So recognizing what the four-letter or the four-word hashtag that is prob probably abbreviated to a four-letter hashtag. If you figure that out, then you should be you should be able to figure out what the you should be able to figure out the name of the person. So there's one person who's a Muslim foreigner who's done really well for people of mercy side and because of which uh, everyone's uh, becomes far, far less Islamophobic there. So it shows that if you have positive role models, then a lot of hate crimes can, can be reduced and so on. Yeah, go on, Harish, I think. Yeah, okay, so uh, question 14. Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug was perhaps the first novel to have cryptography needed to solve clues. So it had a substitution cipher code of gibberish symbols standing for letters from the English alphabet that had to be solved by analyzing the frequency of letters in the English words. So Alfred Mosher Butts took inspiration from this cryptogram method for which popular creation office. Uh, so if you want a timeline, first half of 20th century. Um, so in the gold bug, you have some symbols there. And uh, the way you solve, the, you solve for those symbols is by figuring out that uh, figuring out which symbol stands for which English letter and you do that by studying the frequency of letters in English words this idea of studying analyzing the frequency of letters in English words was uh, captivating to this guy called Alfred Mosher Butts and he used it in some pop very very popular creation of his so what popular creation is this. One word answer. Okay, no, if there are no questions, let's move on to question 15, the last of this quarter. In 642 AD, Pallava ruler Narasimha Varman I defeated the Chalukya ruler Pulikeshin II, who had earlier defeated Harsha Vardhana from North India. Harsha was the emperor of the plains of North India and had his capital in Kanuj in Uttar Pradesh. So future Pallava temples included several sculptures of a particular form of Shiva quelling the vanity of a certain boisterous being as a simile for the Pallavas effectively having control over the forces of North India. So whom is Shiva humbling in this particular form? So I'm giving you a few more examples. All of these are from the Kailasanatha temple. So this is a form of Shiva where uh, he is uh, quelling the vanity of a certain boisterous being that descends from above. And it symbolizes having uh, control over the forces of North India. So the Pallavas like, imagine themselves to be like the Shiva and they're saying, just like Shiva did this, we also did this. 
effectively. So whom is Shiva humbling in this particular form? As a hint, I'll tell you that knowing a little bit of Indian geography more than history will be helpful. So think of where Kanauj is. And I've made a stupid pun about lockdown. So he's doing something with lock. Right. I think that's sufficient time. Let's move on to the answers for this quarter. So question 11. A lot of raised hands. Is this the lightsaber? That is correct. This is, the, yeah. this is the lightsaber. So if you've written lightsaber, you get full points. If you've made small spelling mistakes, added a space, put an hyphen in between. S A B R E, all of that is fine. This is a lightsaber. Question 12. Hello. Yeah, go on. Is what's your name? Hello. I'm Akash Kumar. All right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What's, uh, what's the answer? Color yellow. It's not the color yellow. Hi, this is Arun. Yeah, go on. The answer is a pearl. You can see a pearl in every photo. Where That's right. This is the pearl. Uh, Margarita means the pearl. And so the word Manjari became Margarita, which became Margarita. So the answer has the word pearl, you get full points. Nothing else gets you points. A necklace, jewel, gemstone, that doesn't cut it. It needs to be pearl. Okay. So 2019 research from Stanford. So who is this Muslim? Yeah, with it, go on. Is it Salah? That is correct. This is no more Salah. The hashtags are you'll now walk around Y N W A and so on. So this is uh, Mohammed Salah. Salah will get you points. No points for just Mohammed. Yeah, because that's a pretty common name. Question 14. Ranga, please go ahead. Uh, Scrabble. That is correct. This is how the point system for Scrabble was devised. So they analyzed the frequency of uh, letters in the English alphabet and uh, give these points. That's why Z has 10 and A has 1 and E has 1. That's all right. Well worked out. Scrabble is the only acceptable answer. Question 15. So who is the force of North India, boisterous being who had a lot of pride, whom Shiva uh, locks and uh, quells the vanity and all of that. Metaphor of Pallavas yes, conquering. Uh, uh -huh. uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, I think this is the Ganga. Shiva locked the Ganga in his hair. That the is correct. Locks of his hair. That is right. This is Ganga. So this is Ganga Visarjana Murti or Ganga Dana Murti. And the, so Shiva uh, um, contains Ganga in one of his hair locks. And Kanauj is kind of close to the Ganges. At least the kingdom then was very close to the Ganges. And uh, then that is why this culture is so popular in Pallava temples. So Ganga, uh, Ganges and any of the synonyms of Ganga will work. Right. So that's 15 questions and we're three quarters through. Uh, and the last quarter is coming up. 
question 16. Edward Young, uh, the creator of a certain classic design, took inspiration from the simplicity, novel color scheme, fonts and sizes of the Albatross series of books. A prominent change in Young's design was that instead of the Albatross, it had the company logo, a very stinky bird. He sketched on a visit to the London Zoo. So what bird did he sketch, which is also the name of the company? So you see a book here from the Albatross series. Uh, that's another pub publisher from the early 20th century. Uh, so Edward Young was inspired by this design, this novel color scheme and a classic design. And he, he decided to make small changes to it. The most prominent of which was that uh, instead of the Albatross, he had another bird. So what bird was this? Right? Seems to be simple enough. Uh, Harish, right. so there's a question which says, should we write both the company and the bird name? Yeah, the same thing. They're, they're, they're the same. The same word. So the company is probably called Bird Inc. or Bird Company or Bird Publishing something. So the name of the bird is what we want. Question 17. Art historians speculate that the elephant turning its head away from the church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. In, so if you look at this image here, you find an elephant there. This was made by Bernini. Okay, and you see that it's turning its head away from a building in the in, in the back towards the right. So the um, historians speculate that the elephant is turning its head away from this church uh, was because of uh, was because of was, was Bernini's way of condemning an event from the 1630s that took place in this church and revolved around a man and his claims. So this is in Rome. Something happened in that specific church in the 1630s, which Bernini did not like. And this is his, how he's showing his condemnation of it. So who was the center of controversy in the 1630s event? Okay, so look, look at the words that I've made in yellow and think of uh, somebody who was in Rome then, who was in controversy from the church. You, the church put him in trouble because of something he said about revolving around and he was at the center of it. I want the name of a person. It looks like a lot of you have got this. So we're in question 18. So during the Brexit negotiations of last year, English MP uh, Jacob rees mogg supported the policy that Britain needed a guarantee that there wouldn't be a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and the UK. On official terms, the need for an Irish backstop. So an Irish backstop is some sort of guarantees for trade and uh, all of that. So many Twitter users reminded uh, Jacob rees on a humorous note that England already had a very successful Irish backstop. So who were these Twitter users referring to? I need the name of a person. So during the negotiations, Jacob rees said we need, he was insisting that we need to get an Irish backstop on the border. And people told him, we already have an Irish backstop. So who are they referring to? So a name will do, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to figure out the first name as well. Rather than figure out, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an unusual first name, so you'll get it.
All right, if there are no questions, we go to question 19. Uh, the, the penultimate question of the quiz. Toy, toy makers in the US anticipated a significant dip in sales in 1908 after a certain individual decided to retire. So they introduced this doll called the Billy Possum, named after Billy Taft or William Taft. But this doll, the Billy Possum, never took off because the original doll uh, uh, that was named after the person who was retiring, um, that original doll was very popular and he is popular even now. So who is the person who retired in 1908? I want the first name for this because there are multiple people with the same surname. Multiple famous people with the same surname. So and I need the name of a person after whom a certain doll was named. This person retired in 1908. And his position was filled by William Tuft. So who is this person? All right, no questions. And hence we go to the last question of the quiz. In the early 20th century, a Marathi man's money Marathi man's money lenders wanted to see a prototype before they funded his big idea, his big seminal idea. To finance the production of this prototype, which is a recording of the growth of a pea plant, the man sold off all his possessions except his wife's Mangal Sutra. Impressed by his struggles in near poverty and the honesty to his work, his friends likened him to a character from mythology, from Indian Hindu mythology, and gave him a nickname that would go on to influence his choices once he secured loans. So what nickname is this? Which is also the name of a character from mythology. So there's a Marathi man in the early 20th century. He needed money for his big seminal idea, but uh, he, did not, he did not get money from money lenders until they, they saw a prototype. So he recorded the growth of a pea plant for which he sold off all his wealth and he was living in uh, abject poverty. And his friends you know, likened him to a character from mythology because of his condition and gave him a nickname. So once he secured loans, this specific nickname influenced what he did. So what is this nickname? Which is the same as a character from mythology. This is the last question from the quiz. As a, yeah, as a hint. So, Harish, the, there's a question of the name of the person is enough or if the nickname is needed. So you can just try. Yeah, I need the nickname. I don't need the name of the person. I need I, I need the nickname he got, which is the same as a character from mythology. I'll give you a hint. If you know my name, then that, that's, a, uh, that's a hint. If you've been paying attention to the quiz and figured out what my name was, then you can also figure out the name of the character from mythology. <laughs> And uh, Harish, there's a question on whether they sh should submit now. Uh, so to everyone, uh, wait till the next five questions are discussed. And once you know whether you've got it right or wrong, mark those questions. And once you have all of them, submit it. So yes. wait till all the discussion happens. Yes. This is five more questions. We'll, we'll be done in five minutes. All right. So let's move on, move on to the answers. Question 16, a steady increase in the number of raised hands. May be, please go ahead. Is anyone there? Akshay, please go ahead. Uh, it's Penguin. 
is right. This is penguin. So my novel color scheme. So penguin has different colors for different kinds of novels and so on. So this is penguin. Uh, the word penguin is needed for points. No points for pelican, puffin, all of those other publications also. But those are all uh, subsidiaries of penguin. So penguin is the correct answer. Question 17. So what happened in this church in 1630s? Who was in the center of controversy in 1630s in this church? Asha, please go ahead. Answer is Galileo Galilei. That is correct. This is Galileo Galilei. The event that happened was his inquisition. He, uh, he said that the earth uh, moves around the sun and so on. And, uh, that was very controversial. So the word Galileo should be part of the answer. If you've written just Galilee, yes, if you're writing some surname, that also is sufficient. But you should have written either Galileo or Galilee for the full one point. And same with the rest of the quiz. If you uh, if you come close, uh, unless you have the keyword, you don't get points, even if you come close. Question 18. Wow. I'll raise hands for this question. I thought it was probably the toughest question in the quiz. So who's the Irish backstop? Hey, please go ahead. It's Jan Morgan. That is correct. Can you explain why? Uh, because he was chosen to captain the England cricket team, being coming from the Irish team, Ireland team. Yeah, okay, fine. So the, the, the funder is a backstop. is something that is placed behind as a barrier support reinforcement, that is a wicket keeper. And so uh, the, I, Iron Morgan was a wicket keeper for, a, for quite a while. And so Iron Morgan is the right answer because he's originally from Ireland and he was a backstop. So just a surname Morgan is sufficient for points. The question 19. So who retired in 1908? Siddharth, please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, this is Uncle Sam. Not Uncle Sam, he's a real life person. Siddharth, please go ahead. It's uh, Terry Roosevelt. That is correct. This is Theodore Roosevelt, uh, after whom the teddy bear is named. Uh, so they anticipated that once Theodore Roosevelt retires, nobody will buy teddy bears anymore. And so they came up with uh, uh, this, this Billy Possum after William Taft. But turns out people like teddy bears and nobody liked a Billy Possum. So Ted Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Theo Roosevelt, all of that is fine. You don't get points if you just said Roosevelt or just said teddy bear. I made it very clear during when going through the question. And the last question, of the quiz. Udhav, please go ahead. Um, this is uh, Harish Chandra, Dada Sahib Falke. Very good. So this is uh, Raja Harish Chandra, and the man was Dada Sahib Palke. The correct answer is, of course, Harish Chandra, because then this is uh, this is why uh, Dada Sahib Palki decided to make the first movie on his life. Uh, so Harish Chandra, Hari Chandra, all those local variations of the name, Hari Chandar, Hari Chandrudu, all of those are not work. You don't get points for Dada Sahib Palki. You don't, Dada Sahib is not the nickname, all of that. So you need to have written ha ha Hari Chandra, Harish Chandra, because I specifically said, what is the name of the character from mythology, which is the same as the nickname? And which is the same as something he he did. So, uh, Harish Chandra, Hari Chandra, all of that is right. So, at, at uh, this point, you should have completed your 20 questions and you should be ready to submit your form. So, once you submit your form, uh, just you, you'll get a link to uh, a certain Excel sheet which has some statistics. Let's just wait, wait on that for a bit and then. Uh, I'll resume in a couple of minutes once we see significant number of submissions.
Yep. So if once you do that, you can, uh, if you have written your right email ID, you would have got a mail with your responses. You can just open that mail and then you can compute your score and then you can um, and find where you are placed with respect to the world and your peers in your specific category here. So, so far we've had 175 not participants. Somebody's got 20 out of 20. Wow. Okay. If you're honest to yourself, great. Um, so the median is around 11. And school kids have been doing much better than open quizzes, which is interesting. So on. So you have a lot of interesting stats here, all by our uh, Excel god Vinit. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, people. Uh, I hope uh, this was isn't too tedious for you. Uh, thanks for turning up in huge numbers on a weekday. Uh, the next quiz will happen soon and you will get a mail uh, through the same channels you did get now. And I, with this, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and end the recordings. Uh, thank you and have a good night.